want to talk a little bit about the economy. Uh, we saw the markets take a big hit today. Uh, generally, markets are down quite a bit this month and quite a bit this year. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that, about the effects of uh, inflation, about the war, uh, about uh, the budget deficits and everything else on what is going on from an economic perspective um, and, uh, and, and, and what we can expect in terms of primarily inflation, because I think that's the most interesting of all of these. There is a new, um, there is a new what do you call it, substack that I am really finding really fascinating. It's, it's an economist. I think he's an economist. He's an economist. I think he's an economist. Uh, Brian Kaplan, uh, who's, who's a, a, a free market economist. He's actually, maybe he's a, anyway, I think he's an economist. Anyway, Brian Kaplan has written a lot of excellent books. Um, he is uh, one of my favorite economists out there. Um, this is a uh, new substack that he has that I think is excellent uh, on so many issues. I find myself agreeing with him. Um, he is warning. He is when push come to shove, he is an anarchist. Um, so that is a real problem. But on so many things, he's right online. And I don't know how much of an anarchist he really is. Um, one would have to push and shove to see, but um, but he doesn't have the nihilism, the sub total subjectivism, um, and what I find irrationality that most anarchists seem to have. So again, uh, I'm a fan. I've subscribed to Substack. I encourage you to. It's Brian Kaplan. Um, it, 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 the Substack is called Bet on It. Uh, Brian, B-R-Y-A-N, Kaplan with a C-C-A-P-L-A-N. Uh, anyway, Brian earlier this week had a, uh, a really good substack on the economy. He called it the economy. It's very strange these days. And I think there's a lot to what he says. I mean, I don't think, I don't think it's that unexpectedly strange. I don't think it's that weird when you take into account everything that he's been going on uh, over the last uh, few decades. But... If you just look at the stats, it looks weird. It looks strange. And let's start with the fact. Uh, so we're going to go over uh, his write-up here, and I'll, I will comment on some of these <coughs> observations that he makes. Um, again, I encourage you to subscribe uh, to the Substack. Let's start with the fact that we're seeing the highest inflation that any of us uh, have seen since the early 1980s, late 1970s. Um, and many of us were very young back then. Um, I, of course, I lived in Israel in the early 1980s where inflation was over 1,000%, so it quite, was quite impressive. Um, and uh, we survived that. But in America, we have not seen inflation this high since the early 1980s. Um, inflation now is at around 8.5%. And inflation here, I mean... <coughs> Eight point, uh, here I mean CPI, price inflation. Uh, one of Freeman said uh, Peter Schiff was right. Yeah, Peter Schiff at some point was going to be right. Um, Peter Schiff has been calling for inflation for the last uh, 25 years, and he's right, finally. Um, at some point, we were going to have inflation. That it, it was not, uh, that's not a big surprise. Uh, it's, it's can you identify when we're going to have inflation? That's how you make money off of it. And that, I don't think anybody has been particularly good at. Um, so inflation is at 8.5, which is a particularly high rate, um, arguably um, for many people, because CPI is the consumer price index. Um, it really depends on the basket of goods that you purchase. Um, the, way they, the way they measure inflation is they choose a basket of goods, like things that Americans buy, and then they track the price increases of those things that typical Americans buy. Um, some baskets of goods have higher inflation, have gone up in price more than other baskets of goods. This is part of the problem with using any kind of price inflation number. There are lots of them. You'll find that the Fed releases a number of different inflation numbers. There's core inflation. Uh, there's inflation. Uh, there's there's uh, uh, a variety of other um you know, uh, there's the producer price inflation. 
and there's a variety of different measures of inflation. There's inflation the way they used to measure it, which uh, would suggest much higher inflation today uh, than the way we measure it today. But the fact is that inflation is high uh, by any measure, by any measure um, that you look at it. Uh, it's, it's at 8.5. And if you remember just a few months ago, people were talking about transitory. Uh, the Biden administration, many economists were saying, no, 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 this is all a result of supply chains. No, uh, this is inflation. This is prices going up. It's sustained. Um, I've, I've, I've said this for a long time now. Uh, John Cochran has been at the forefront of this. John Cochran, another economist I like a lot, has been at the forefront of this. Uh, this is inflation in that prices are up and they're staying up. And it's not just because of supply chain issues. It's not inflation caused by, quote, shortages. Shortages resulting in prices going up. Indeed, as Brian Kaplan will explain, explains in this piece, based on the shortages, prices should be going up even more. The fact that you walk into a, I walked into CVS in New York City, when was it? A week ago, a week and a half ago, and the shelves were literally empty. Empty. That means that the prices of those goods were not high enough. That is, the fact that you're seeing empty shelves suggests that companies are not raising prices fast enough. That happened during COVID. That's happening right now. Prices should be going up faster in those places where you get shortages. The war on energy doesn't cause inflation. That's the other thing. All prices going up doesn't cause inflation because if the money supply is fixed and one product's price goes up, then a demand for that product goes down and at the same time people shift to substitutes which are cheaper. So the mix of things that people buy changes, the basket changes. So this is part of the problem of, of this term of inflation because the basket of goods changes. People, people's purchasing habits change based on price levels. And if oil goes up, people buy less oil. They start driving less. They, they might look for different substitutes. Uh, they might do things differently or they might just allocate a different amount. If they're spending more on oil... They have less to spend on other things. Their prices go down. Inflation fundamentally is a monetary phenomenon. It is fundamentally a result of having more money in the system without productivity and the number of goods actually going up. What causes inflation is the printing of money. What causes inflation is the massive creation of money without the backing of more goods, more production, more productivity. So the fact that a, a price goes up like oil might result in a price shock. This is, this is why it was all talked about supply chain shocks. It might cause a price shock, but it should not cause sustained inflation. Sustained inflation is what happens when the Federal Reserve starts printing money, when the federal government starts spending money like there's no tomorrow, which is what we've seen, right? So the first observation in terms of economics is, in terms of the economy, is that we have real inflation, not just supply shocks, not just shortages, but real inflation. But in addition to the inflation, we've got real shortages. You cannot get all the stuff that you'd like to get at the market price. Now, this is caused partially because market prices are not adjusting upwards because I think there's a fear because of Elizabeth Warren, because of the culture, because of the way we, we think about prices, the way we think about profits. There's a fear to raise prices. As you might know, Elizabeth Warren is blaming the inflation on corporate greed. Because before there was 8.5% inflation, there was no corporate greed. And then suddenly over the last few months, there's been a lot of corporate greed. So corporations have bumped up prices 
And that's why we have inflation. I mean, it's so bizarre. It's so silly and nonsensical. It's almost not worth commenting on. But Elizabeth Wong keeps repeating it. it just, and we've got inflation. Some things are just unavailable. You cannot find windows in Puerto Rico, garage doors or heating oil drums in some places. Uh, Brian uh, suggests. They're just things you can't get. Unemployment, the same time, is at, it's very close to its 50-year low. Even though we had the largest unemployment spike um, in 2020 in all of recorded history. The sharpest drop in employment. And yet unemployment, as measured by the government, is at a 50-year low right now. At the same time, this is all the different things going on. At the same time, labor force participation is still way below you know where it's been since uh, since really the 1970s way below the maximum rate which was in the early 2000s late 1990s early 2000s and still quite a bit below what it was before the pandemic so labor force participation has been declining, suddenly declined dramatically during the, after the 2008-2009 recession. It declined through the Obama presidency, kind of stabilized under uh, Trump, didn't really rise a lot, but stabilized. It took a huge beating during COVID and has not recovered since then. Labor force participation is the number of adults actually working. Whereas unemployment is measured as based on the number of people looking for work. So if you're not working, but not looking for work, you don't count as unemployed, which is kind of bizarre. So labor force participation is still not recovered. Prime age labor force participation, right, is nearly fully recovered. Prime age meaning 40s, 50s. Young people are not participating in the workforce. Their labor force participation is really low. Old people over 65 are not participating in the workforce. Their labor participation rate is really low. Oh my God, this is all getting screwed up. Sorry, the, my software here is all over the place. All right. So what you get is older people older people are um, retiring and not coming back to work. Younger people are in their parents' basement. The only people really who have come back fully to work are adults. Over 30, over 35. Yep. Over this period, the amount of money in the economy, the amount of money that the Federal Reserve produces and pumps out there into the economy has grown dramatically. Not surprising, inflation is up. Uh, from, uh, you know, during COVID, the, the amount of money in the economy is just a money supply, M0, has just gone through the roof, right? And the Fed has just pumped out money. It started to shrink a little bit. The amount of money in the economy started to shrink a little bit, but still nothing as compared to what they pumped out. Remember, this is a Federal Reserve run by a Republican, Jerome Powell, nominated to the job by Trump number of Republicans on the Federal Reserve Board voting for this. And they have just been flooding, flooding the system with money. So it's a weird economy. On the one hand, it looks like the economy is growing and plenty of jobs, more jobs than there are people. The economy is doing what looks like really, really well. It's really, really strong. Job creation is really strong. Inflation is really high. Unemployment is really low, but a lot of people are not participating in the workforce. 
A lot of young people are staying in their parents' basement. They're not going back to work. They lost their job during COVID and they're not going back to work. A lot of old people, for whatever reason, have decided to retire early or retire earlier than they would have otherwise and not going back to work. What's going on here? Well, first, look, this is all a result of the insane growth of government over the last hundred years. And the fact that government today has what you would consider unlimited power. Government today can do anything it wants. Government today can print whatever money it wants, can distribute it to whoever, who want, whoever it wants to distribute it, can bail out whoever it wants. There's no limit right now, constitutional, legal, legislative, to the power that the government has taken upon itself. And as a consequence, when a crisis happens, like COVID, the response of government has been to dramatically expand its mandate. Write checks to everybody. Spend like there's no tomorrow. Mandates. Government just went through the roof in terms of its growth, in terms of its power, in terms of its impact on our lives. And while, you know, Trump started this with stimulus after stimulus after stimulus, he told us to stay home and then they sent us checks to compensate for that. And you could argue that maybe, you know, Trump's stimuluses would have been okay in terms of inflation if they'd stopped there. But the fact is that they didn't stop. That when Biden came into office, he did another $1.9 trillion stimulus. Now, I strongly believe that if Trump had been reelected, he would have done the same thing. So I don't think there's a difference here. I mean, indeed, Trump was lobbying for an actual increase, if you remember, for 1400 per person in the stimulus bill to actually 2,000 per person. So Trump wanted actually to have an even bigger stimulus. But they wanted a bigger and bigger and bigger stimulus. So physical policy, government spending out of control. Massive government overreach. But this is what you get. When you give government the kind of power that they have, they are going to try to buy votes. They're going to try to make you happy. And the easiest way to make you happy is to send you a check at home. Now, what's interesting is that the American government does this on a grander, bigger scale than anybody else. So while everybody stimulated the economy, everybody had massive physical stimulus during COVID, the U.S. did more of it than anybody else. If you look at, um, if you look at inflation, one of the ways to see that inflation is not just the supply chain, is to look at inflation across the world. If inflation was just the supply chain issue, was just shortages, then you would expect inflation to be high everywhere because everywhere in the world is experiencing shortages. For example, Japan is an island. It is an island that it depends on importing many of its goods. Certainly, um, uh, somebody mentioned oil, the oil shock. Oil prices have gone through the roof. Energy prices have gone through the roof. It's all energy policy. Well, Japan imports all its energy. You'd expect Japanese inflation to be through the roof right now. And yet Japan is experiencing almost no inflation. Exactly for the reason I told you before. Energy prices might be up, but other prices are down. So overall, inflation in Japan is about 1%. In the United States, it's 8.5%. The reason... It's 8.5% in the U.S. and 1% in Japan is because Japan has not pumped huge amount of money through physical policy into the economy the way the United States, not just through physical, through physical and monetary policy, into the economy the way the U.S. did during COVID. The same is true in Europe. Europe has inflation, 4 to 5%, not 85 because their stimulus was significantly lower than ours. So, Inflation is a monetary and physical phenomenon. It's a phenomenon of deficits that the market believes cannot be paid and of monetizing those deficits by the Federal Reserve, just printing money. The Fed basically printed money like it was at war. It printed money not to fulfill its goal of price stability, 
It printed money to fulfill its goal of appeasing the politicians, of appeasing the political class, of sustaining the U.S. economy, of bailing everybody out. And as a consequence, as you probably know, it bailed out dozens, and as we've talked about in the past, it bailed out dozens and dozens of companies that should have gone bankrupt during COVID. It bailed out many what we call zombie companies. And one of the things we're going to see is as we head into a recession, the zombie companies that should have gone bust in 2020 are going to go bust in 2023. You have to pay the piper. There have to be consequences to bad managers, to going taking on too much debt, to doing stupid things business-wise. The Fed bailed everybody out. Not too big to fail. They bailed everybody out. As they raise interest rates, as we'll talk about, those businesses are going to collapse. Those businesses are going to go under. Um, at the same time, at the same time, interest rates, because of the way the Fed has behaved, because of the way it's bought up debt, it's bought up bonds, it's expanded what they call expanded the balance sheet by buying up bonds. Because of that, because it's been buying up all this debt, we basically had Negative interest rates. Negative interest rates. That is, you're basically paying people to borrow your money. I mean, think about the prime rate right now. The prime rate now now is five percentage points below inflation. It's, you're basically losing money by lending the money out at prime rates. So we have an environment of what in a free market would be an impossibility, something that could never happen, something that would never happen, which is negative interest rates. Interest rates are always supposed to be positive. So in the United States, they're positive, but they see an interest rate should be made up of three components, three components. Here's a finance 101 lesson. Interest rates should be composed of three components. One, inflation, right? So uh, if I'm lending you $10, I want to make sure that the $10, when I get the money back, that I am compensated for the fact that over the next year, that $10 is going to lose its purchasing power. So if inflation's 8.5% over the next year, I want at least 8.5% to compensate me for the loss of purchasing power. So one component is inflation. The second component is risk. I'm not sure you can pay me back. So I want to be compensated. I want to profit because I'm lending out to a bunch of people. Some people I'm going to lose the I'm going to lose the loan. They're not going to pay me back. So I want to make sure that the people who do pay me back pay me back a premium to compensate for the risk associated with some people not paying me back. And the third is I want to be compensated for what's called the time value of money. I want to be compensated for the fact that I cannot use the money today. I want to be compensated for the fact that I cannot invest it in other things today. I want to be compensated for the fact that I can't go and buy ice cream with it today. That's called the real interest rate. It's called the time value of money. So the real interest rate is typically 1%, 2%. Then on top of that, you have risk, depends on the investment, depends on the loan. Let's say it's a government loan, the risk is zero. The U.S. government will pay back its loans, we assume. Then that's zero. And then you have inflation, 8.5%. So one-year interest rates right now should be 8.5% plus a real return of 1% to 2%. So that's between 95 to 10.5%. You won't find a U.S. one-year treasury bill selling for 10.5%. So somebody is buying it for well, let's say I haven't looked at what it is right now, but let's say it's uh, 2%, 3%. Basically, they're giving up. They're losing money. When they get the money back in a year, they will be able to buy less with it. Now, that's upside-down economics. That's complete insanity. And the only way that is possible is because of artificial manipulation by the Federal Reserve. So we have negative interest rates, have had... For years now, negative interest rates. So, 
So we have prices not adjusting. We have wages. This is the other problem. We've, we've heard over the last few years that wages are rising. But wages are not rising enough to compensate for 8.5% inflation. So real wages, in terms of the purchasing power of the dollar, real wages over the last year have declined significantly, dramatically. So people are getting poorer. Even working people are getting poorer. And young people are not going to work. I don't know. Parents must be willing to subsidize their kids because of COVID. Young people idle. Not all young people, obviously, but enough young people idle. Now, the response to this inflation is going to be a Federal Reserve that increases interest rates and starts selling all those loans that they've been buying. By selling those loans, they're going to drive up interest rates. People are going to buy them, but they're going to want to pay less and less money for them. The less they pay for them, the higher their interest rate. And the Fed is also driving up interest rates just by raising the bank lending rates. And what you're going to see is rising rates across the entire rate spectrum, from short-term rates to long-term rates. As interest rates rise, let's say you have a, um, a, fi a variable rate mortgage. Well, as rates on mortgage rise, you will have to start paying more and more and more money as your monthly mortgage payment. Many of you didn't take out 30-year loans, as I advised. You took out variable rates, and therefore you're going to have to pay more and more and more interest. Some of you won't be able to afford that. Some of you will default on your mortgages. Businesses that have loans with banks, have loans with other financial institutions, might have bonds in the marketplace. As the rates start going up, won't be able to refinance those loans. If they're, if they're variable rate loans, won't be, able to find, won't be able to have the cash to pay interest payments on. They're going to default on those. What happens when companies default on bonds and loans? What do we call that? We call that bankruptcy. So companies are going to go bankrupt. That's what a recession means. A recession means companies laying people off, companies cutting costs, companies going bankrupt because they cannot, usually it's caused by the fact that they cannot pay their debt obligations. Now in a normal time, you'd have that anyway. But what's going to exacerbate it this time is the fact that the Federal Reserve has been bailing out all these companies for years now. All these zombie companies are in a horrible condition to be able to pay back their debt. The only reason they've sustained themselves is because of the Federal Reserve bailing them out, buying up their bonds. As this gets reversed, not only are the normal, some normal companies going to get into financial trouble, but all these zombie companies are going to get into financial trouble. And that's where you get a recession. So I think there's a good likelihood that we will get a recession. There's a good likelihood that that recession won't happen this year. It'll happen in 2023. I think to that extent, the uh, Powell Fed is trying to help Biden um, and the Democrats not get completely swamped in the 2022 midterm elections. If a recession happens this year, Democrats will be crushed. They're going to get crushed anyway. But with a the recession, they'll be completely crushed. So they're, they're delaying. Everybody says, why isn't the Fed acting faster? I think they're not acting faster because they don't want a recession this year because it's an election year. So much for the independence of the Federal Reserve. But that's true. Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't matter. They're always like this. Okay. So we're heading towards a recession. Um, it, it's going to be very hard to avoid we could very well get stagflation where we get both a recession and inflation. I think part of that is mitigated by the fact that Republicans are probably going to win the House and Senate. If they do, I think the markets will view that very positively. And the reason for that is Republican House, Senate, Democratic president, usually what you see is 
spending as a percent of GDP decline, or at least flatten out. So the good news is, I think I, I think that reverses itself if you get a Republican in the in in the White House, but we don't have to worry about that for another three years. But at least for this year, divided government is good. Divided government is, means lower spending. Um, that the markets would view as a good thing. Um, I think that will suppress inflation expectations. And I think the Fed raising interest rates will work. It will work to force the market into recession, but it'll also work to crush inflation, uh, bring it back down. So I expect we're heading towards a period of inflation, recession, back to low inflation again. All bets are off if Republicans have the House, the Senate, and the presidency and start spending like there's no tomorrow again. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brook Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content. And of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.